If you would have told me last summer that coming into 2024 that we would be talking about the next person to exit Scream 7 instead of joining the cast, I would have said that no one could be that stupid to kill the hottest returning horror franchise this century. But here we are. With the current state of the franchise, details about what the story would have been about has leaked, something not uncommon for the franchise over the years. In fact, alternate scripts from some of the previous films are available online, which several of them feature unpredictable twists and turns that would have left audiences on the edge of their seats. But as the ideas emerged online, those ideas were scrapped. Today, we're going to dive into those lost versions of the Scream sequels as we discuss five lost sequels in the Scream franchise that you may not have or probably heard of. Scream 2. Originally, Scream 2 was planned to be the first film to feature three killers along with an added twist at the end. However, those plans were altered and Scream 6 became the first film to introduce this plot twist. After Phil and Maureen's murder, reporters swarm Windsor College to get Sydney's reaction. However, one reporter, Debbie Salt, confronts Sydney asking her if she's responsible for the murders, which results in Gail punching her. <laughs> Did you get that all to The incident is caught on camera by Randy, Gail's new cameraman. Yes, in this version of the script, the characters of Randy and Joel swap places. Joel is now a part of the new friend group and Derek's roommate. Many of the narratives still play out largely the same with some minor tweaks along the way until we get to the third act where we see two ghost faces appear on screen at the same time to kill Mickey in a similar fashion as they attacked Chad in the latest film. Sid seeks cover in the campus theater where three set walls drop from the ceiling, each with a body attached. It's Dewey, Hallie, and Joel, all who are presumably dead. A panicked Sydney backs away from their bodies when Cotton falls through the stage door, bound with duct tape. Derek then emerges from the darkness of the theater and reveals himself to be behind the murders. A shocked Sydney backs into Hallie's lifeless body when she suddenly springs to life behind her, revealing herself as the other killer and Derek's girlfriend. Derek confesses to finding love over the internet and explains that Hollywood always has the good guy win in horror movies, which he and his girlfriend aim to change. Enter Mrs. Loomis. Not only is she the third killer, but the mastermind. She kills off her accomplices, revealing her motive of revenge and the plan to frame Cotton for it all. Cotton manages to escape and kills Mrs. Loomis, saving Sydney. However, the twist comes when Cotton reveals that he did not come to the college to interview with Sydney, but to kill her. Scream 2 would end in a cliffhanger knife fight between Cotton and Sydney, where both drop to the stage floor as the scream cuts to black. Scream 3, The Williamson Cut Now we know that there are some details out there about what this was meant to be, and after conducting some extensive research through the vast expanse of the internet and its archives, I've managed to piece together some additional puzzle pieces about what Kevin Williamson's cancelled cut of Scream 3 would have been. Originally, the film was set to open with a scene of a teenager alone at home on a stormy night watching a horror movie on his couch. Suddenly a bolt of lightning strikes, plunging the house into darkness. The teen scrambles to find a flashlight and a phone, but before he can do so, he hears heavy footsteps approaching him from behind. He turns around only to be brutally stabbed in the stomach. The director yells, cut! 
The camera pans out to reveal the scene was being filmed on the set of Stab 3. One of the co-stars rushes to check on the supposedly stabbed actor, only to discover that he has been murdered in real life. This opening sets the stage for a story that intertwines the lives of Gail and Sidney, both who have moved on to have careers in Hollywood since the events of Windsor College. Gail is now a screenwriter and producer. She has penned the script for Stab 3, which becomes the site of the latest series of gruesome murders. As Sydney becomes entangled in danger surrounding the film, she's led back to the town of Woodsboro, where it all began. Well, sort of. It's the set of Stab 3 that she only sees for the first time in the final act of the film. She's chased through the set pieces of Woodsboro and into the Mocker House. <laughs> where she comes face to face with a cult of killers who have been brought together through their shared passion for the Stab film franchise, along with one single person acting as their guide, Stu Mocker himself. Scream 3, The Kruger Cut The opening of Part 3 featured a random Hollywood actor being lured to his death instead of Cotton, and as the murders continue to unfold, newspaper clippings about Maureen Prescott's death are left at each of the crime scenes instead of photos of Rena Reynolds. Like in the version we got, Mark Kincaid enlists the help of Gail due to her knowledge of the previous attacks. When we are reintroduced to Sydney later in the film, we learn that she has become a survivor in more ways than one having not only survived the events in the previous two films, but also having gone to a darker place where she tried to end her life between films and coming out a stronger version of herself. Some minor changes are sprinkled in over the next few scenes, including Angelina being murdered at Jennifer Jolie's house by Ghostface along with Tom. And then shortly after Sydney arrives in Hollywood, she's attacked at the studio by not one, but two ghost face killers in the bathroom, while Gail and Jennifer's research leads them to a confrontation with Milton at the studio that is soon upended by Ghostface. Hey, let it go. It's dead and buried. How would you like to see it dug up on national TV? Why don't you tell me what happened? Ghostface kills Milton as he leaves the studio, then stalks Gail, Dewey, and Jennifer who stayed behind to snoop through Milton's office. Jennifer is quickly killed off, and so is Kincaid, who suspiciously shows up before Ghostface captures Gail and Dewey to use his bait to lure Sydney back to the studio. After Sid arrives, she finds Gail and Dewey on the soundstage of Stab 3, which features reproductions of her home and stews. Ghostface attacks, separating them, and Sydney and Gail come across Angelina's dead body and are taken aback by the sight of her corpse. But to their surprise, Angelina springs to life, capturing them and leads them into the mocker living room where she reveals that she went to high school with Sid and that she idolized her, but Sidney never knew that Angelina was even alive. But that all changed one day when she met someone. Enter her accomplice and boyfriend, Roman, Sidney's half-brother. Scream 4, the next trilogy. This version of Scream 4 boasts several cutscenes that would have been added back in, such as the alternate opening kills of Jenny and Marnie. The first half of the film plays out much like the original until Olivia's death, where Gail involves herself in Dewey's investigation. I don't see how that pertains to- Because I wrote the book on this. The Woodsboro Murders by Gail Weathers. But you're not a reporter anymore, Gail. And whoa, whoa, even whoa, whoa. if you were- Whoa, don't treat me like I'm the media. I helped solve these things. Three times, remember? 
They follow a lead that brings them to Woodsboro High, where they interview suspects, starting with Robbie and Charlie, in the Cinema Club room. Charlie's interest in horror is revealed to be cult films, not slasher films, so they are ruled out as suspects. Their investigation then leads them to discover the evidence tied to the murders in a teacher's car, who is promptly then taken into custody. Stabathon doesn't occur in this version of Scream 4. Instead, Kirby throws a small party in honor of Olivia that Jill sneaks out of her house to attend. Meanwhile, Ghostface strikes at her house, killing her mom and almost killing Sydney. Police arrive on scene and Sydney convinces Deputy Judy to take her to Kirby's house to see Jill so that she can break the news to her. In the final act, similar to the original, with the exception of Judy being killed, the movie ends at the house. As Jill is being taken out of the house, Dewey arrives just in time to console her. But suddenly, someone yells, We have one alive! A woman! Catching Dewey's attention as the film cuts to the credits. The next two films would follow Jill as she attends college where Sydney is a professor. Fortunately for Jill, she is able to bask in the glory of being the new survivor girl while Sydney suffers with amnesia. Like Scream 2, the past isn't far behind as the murders begin again. Only this time it isn't her and the killer knows her secret. Scream 7 the Carpenter Sister story was set to come to a close with the final chapter of the franchise. The core four, along with Sidney, Kirby, Gale, and Mark Kincaid would be brought back in separate stories taking place in different states where separate attacks would occur throughout the first two acts. Sidney's story would focus on her family, while the Carpenter Sisters would have their own separate storyline. In the end, the surviving legacy characters would unite, likely with the help of Kirby. They would uncover the true identities of the killers, Christina Carpenter and Leslie Mocker. Their motives would tie together the entire franchise, including Part 3, as well as serve as fan service in providing us with a definitive conclusion around Stu Mocker's survival. All the clues and hints over the films were valid, they were just tied to the wrong mocker. During Christina's monologue, it's revealed that her relationship with Billy began before he started dating Sydney, and that they met Roman when he arrived in Woodsboro one year before her mother's death. Roman would reveal the news to Billy as to why his mother left, and together they would devise a plan for revenge. Billy began dating Sydney to get closer to Maureen, all while still being in a relationship with Christina. After Maureen's death, Billy developed a taste for killing and planned to tie up all the loose ends by killing Sydney. And over the next year, he remained in a relationship with Christina and enjoyed making her jealous. After his death, she tried to move on, but Sam ruined it all by breaking up her marriage and turning terror against her. So what do you think about these modified sequels and now lost sequel? Let me know by dropping it in the comments. And if you haven't done so already, drop a like. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, please do that. Every little like and comment and subscription truly helps. It's not just something that we say on YouTube. And as always, thank you very much for tuning in. And until the next, see ya.